So my name is Julie Lang. Um, I am here, of course, today to teach this workshop. I'm also on the organizing committee for Free the Seeds. And if you've been coming to us for several years, then you know every year we've kind of been focusing on some different themes. Last year in particular, we started focusing on our community food system, which is this graphic that you see right up here. And this year we are focusing in particular on the recovery aspect, which is why you're seeing a lot of workshops on composting and um, ways to use things in your garden. Seed saving itself is a recovery process and the workshop that I've developed for today is focused on this idea of recovery in, in what you're eating in the kitchen when you go to go cook from your garden. So um, with our recovery process here, we're looking at closing this gap. We've got this whole circle from production, processing, distribution, consumption, which means if you eat, you're already part of this community here all the way up to recovery. And then it loops all the way back around. And with seeds in particular, um, we're looking at trying to close that gap this year here at Free the Seeds because if you saw when you were down in the seed swap room, we had around 10,000 seeds that we were giving away today. And depending on what time you went through that room, you may have seen the tables were looking a little skint already, which is hard to believe when we've packed 10,000 seeds. So we're really encouraging people to take seeds today, plant them, let them go to seed at the end of the season and collect that seed. There's workshops going on today that'll teach you how to do that. There's lots of other information online on our videos and things to help you do that. And then at the end of next, at the end. Can we, can we get that door closed? It's really noisy. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then after you've collected your seed, bring some back to us. Um, you can bring it back to Free the Seeds next year at our fair, which will be back here hopefully at FBCC should be the same time. We also have a seed library in Columbia Falls. They'll take seed any time of year. So if you're like, I don't want to hold on to it until the fall and have to remember where I put it at that stage before I start my gardening, go ahead and take it into the seed library and they'll make sure that some of that gets over to us. So um, there you go. Email us, we'll help you get started, get seeds going. So, um, so please do do think about making that part of your seed growing and gardening process. While we are encouraging you to donate seeds, um, collect seeds and donate them today, I'm also going to be talking about collecting seeds and using them. Um, a lot of the seeds that I save from my personal garden, I'm actually going to go and use in the kitchen, particularly some of my herb seeds and things like that. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but just, uh, just to give you a little preview there, this is where we're at this year with our recovery theme. So, as I said, my name is Julie Lang. Um, I am here teaching this workshop because I write a food blog called Twice as Tasty. And I've been doing that for several years now. On it, you will find recipes and information and tips and tricks for everything from sourdough to cheese making to pickling and canning to just making really good food for your table. Um, I am particularly excited you guys are all here today because you are my first large group that I get to announce to that I've just signed a contract to write my first cookbook. It's going to be on pickling. So I am going to be sending around a sign up form here. I encourage you to sign up for a couple reasons. One, I don't have a handout today, but you will get information via email about how to find notes from this workshop on my blog going forward. And two, it will keep you in the loop for when that book gets closer to publication and, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to check that out. Plus, I do other workshops. Most of my workshops are taught in private homes. You gather some friends, I come to your house, we make good food in your own kitchen. Um, so there's always an opportunity to, uh, to come and play with some food with me. So today's theme, top to root, savoring it all. Um, I'm particularly fond of because it's kind of the reason I started the food blog to begin with. I've been a, a canner and a pickler. I was doing it growing up. My dad had a big garden and things like that. So I grew up with all of this stuff. But um, when it came time to think about writing a food blog, what really got me there was I'd started to develop recipes that were using the whole foods. So the, um, the kicker recipe for us was um, my grilled tomato chipotle salsa. And when I first started making that recipe and developing it and adapting it, um, I was realizing that in the batch size I was making, I was cooking down the salsa for hours and hours if I didn't want it to just be a watery soup in my jar. So instead, we started pouring off some of the juice to, to just thicken it up from the beginning because the tomatoes were already pre-cooked. I could pour off the juice 
and then I could, um, could can it up and have the right density of the salsa. We were just pouring it down the drain. If I was ambitious, I might carry it out to the compost. Um, and I'm like, that's, that's not good. That's a waste. Why can't I do something with that? So we're like, let's, let's try making it into some Bloody Mary mix. The best grilled tomato Bloody Mary mix you have ever tasted. It is so good, you don't even need to put alcohol in it. You just drink that thing straight up. And so that became the process where all of a sudden, all the friends and their family are like, so what can we get for Christmas? Can we get some salsa? Can we get some Bloody Mix? And I'm like, OK, this is really a labor of love. And um, I don't want to go into full scale production with this recipe, because none of you would probably be able to afford to buy it. But I do want to share it. And I'm a writer and an editor is my day job. So I'm like, this is the time. I'm going to start this blog. I'm going to start this project. And so this idea of instead of just saying, OK, my goal is to make this one thing, salsa. And I've got this other thing that's kind of getting in the way of making it work really efficiently. Instead of just composting it or t throwing it out, now I'm going to turn that into a second product. And that's sort of where my whole blog evolved from. If you go and you visit it, you'll notice that um, a lot of the times I've either got two recipes being posted at once that coincide with each other in such a way, or if I only have one recipe up there, then I'm referring to some others that let you either pair things or put things to use. Um, and so that's really kind of my focus in the blog. And so when we started this recovery theme for this year with Free the Seeds, you can come on in and sit. It's OK. Nope. Top to root. <laughs> no chickens today. <laughs> so, <laughs> right next door. <laughs> so, um, so this whole idea of uh, the recovery theme, I'm like, all right, let's talk about really getting down to the top to root. And so when you think about it, most people don't think about it the way I do. They haven't already gone as far as like, oh, I'm making this killer salsa and I've got this liquid I want to save too. Most of them are like, I'm looking at this pile of either produce that kind of got a little soft or wilty or didn't come out of the garden quite right, or even I'm looking at scraps. Um, so anybody in here a juicer? I get questions from juicers a lot. What do I do with all this pulp that I'm generating? And if you compost, fantastic. You're already doing your recovery. It's going back into your whole system. Personally, I like to try to get as much out of it before I take it as far as the compost bin. And so um, we're going to talk about some of those techniques that you can d do today. Uh, as I talk about this, of course, feel free to, to ask questions as we go along. And always keep in the back of your mind, OK, she does this. She's really kind of a food geek. Maybe this is a little bigger than I want to go. Um, we're going to talk at some point about where you kind of draw that line. And like, OK, is this really worth the process that I just went through to make this particular thing usable? And sometimes the answer is going to be no. And you're going to come back around and, uh, and find where your lines are. But I encourage you to at least start trying. We're going to talk about everything that's as simple as recovery in the seed form, as making some stocks, and as more complex as things like the grilled tomato Bloody Mary mix, because of course you are all going to want this. So um, I'm going to start, even though in some ways it's kind of the end of your cycle from the seed graphic I showed you earlier, I'm going to start with seeds. Um, because that's kind of one of the things that's, in some ways, one of the easiest things to collect for your garden. We all talk about in this area um, and this day particular saving seeds for growing, but I save a lot of seed to use in the kitchen. And this is, um, this is almost, some, you know, seed saving can be super easy, but this is almost easier because you don't really have to worry about whether it's going to germinate again. You're just trying to capture that flavor. And so um, if you're like, oh, I've got, you know, my, my first thing when I started saving seed to garden was I saved way too much seed. I just, I'm like, oh, look, I've got this cilantro plant and it's putting out these huge heads. I'm just going to cut off one plant, put it in a paper bag, and then I've got one plant and I've got this. And I'm like, okay, I'm not planting all of that. <laughs> but I'm going to use it in the kitchen because cilantro seed is what whole spice? Anybody? Coriander. Ground coriander, whole coriander, that's exactly what you're using here. If you're growing your own, you know what you've put on it. You know that even if you've got little um, bits of stem or, or leaf or something in your grinding, you know you haven't put any chemicals or anything nasty on it. So you go ahead and you just use this in your kitchen. Um, I put, I had two jars of this at the end of last growing season. This is what I got left so far for the end for the year. I've been putting that much to use. Um, another and. As if you grow cilantro, you know that thing just wants to go to seed. 
you're doing everything too. I do mine in a coffee grinder. I have just, just a, yep, I just use a cheap, uh, one of the ones you press on and hold down and count, you know, to 100 or, you know, sing happy birthday twice like you do now while you wash your hands. I just do that while I'm grinding and, um, and it grinds it up straight away. You can, have a special, you can have a spice grinder. They make special ones for grinding spices in particular. You can do it with a mortar and pestle. Um, Going to be a little, little work, uh, particularly if you want it fully fine ground. So for fine ground, I definitely prefer the coffee grinder. Um, if I'm doing some pickles and things, or maybe if I'm doing a curry, I might just crush it with a mortar or pestle. If you don't have any of those things and you're just looking to crush it, this stuff crushes easy. You can just put it in a bag, put a, roll a rolling pin over it, and you'll break it all up. Those are all options. Um, but yeah, this stuff wants to go to seeds. So by all means, if you're buying coriander, ground or whole to use in your kitchen, and you've got cilantro out in your garden, that's your first step right there. Um, another good one that I save, obviously in large quantities, is dill. Um, as I mentioned, since I'm going to be writing a cookbook on pickling, I do a fair amount of dill usage in my kitchen. Um, and so that's another good one to save. Again, you can grind it on up in your, in your coffee grinder, and, uh, and you'll end up with your ground version. When you're grinding spices like that, my preference is to store them whole as long as possible. And then I grind up, oh, maybe two ounces at a time, um, just so I don't have to grind every single time I'm cooking. Um, but then it keeps longer whole than it will in the ground form. You'll keep your flavor better. So other seeds um, from the garden that, uh, that we grow a lot of around here, fennel is a good one. If you grow fennel to collect and save that seed, that's an easy one. Um, and you know, anything else that you're growing from a herb that's going to set seed in your garden that is then a culinary spice, essentially, that you're using. Those are all great options for, for starting that top to root idea with your seeds. And it's not just limited to herb seeds. Um, so I was uh, intending to bring in some of the roasted pumpkin seeds to have on my display table today. They have all been consumed at my house at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's a fabulous one. And one of the great things about pumpkin seeds is that you've got your storage pumpkins that you've grown. They're sitting around for several months over the winter and you don't have to deal with those seeds until you use the pumpkin. And if you're doing it for culinary use and you're going to eat those pumpkin seeds, you start, you say, okay, I'm going to open up this pumpkin, I'm going to clean it out, pull out the seeds, clean them off, you roast them up, it all just kind of happens right there in that smaller batch rather than having to do a whole scale, I'm seriously processing food mentality. Uh, so pumpkin seeds are certainly great. Uh, peas, shell peas and shell beans, obviously you're, if you grow shell peas, you, what you're saving to eat as your peas and you're freezing and canning and whatever else, those are, those are your seeds that you're eating right there. Shell beans are another one. Um, I got from Free the Seeds last year some cannellini beans, which is kind of the white kidney bean, and wasn't sure if I'd, I'd never grown shell beans before in my garden, wasn't sure if it would work. Worked beautifully, came up with a, I planted just a few because I didn't want to dedicate too much space to, a, to the experiment, um, but they came up beautifully. And those are, instead of going to the store and buying the dried white beans, now I've got my own home dried this year. Um, I'm going to go and plant more of them from the ones that I've saved and uh, we'll see if they pop up again and I'll have a bigger crop. It's one of my favorite ones to use. Um, another one that you may not think of that I love to save for eating are nasturtium seeds. Nasturtium seeds, if you save them um, and you save them fresh and green and pickle them straight away, taste like capers. And capers can't be grown around here, but nasturtiums will grow and set seed in abundance if you let it. And the plants love it when you pick their seed. They just get happier and grow bigger and longer. So you can eat your nasturtium blossoms, you can eat your leaves, but you can also eat the seeds, and pickled is, is my preferred way to do that. Um, and on my food blog, Twice as Tasty, you'll find recipes for using a lot of these kind of seeds. I've got a recipe up there for pickled nasturtiums. I've got roasted pumpkin seeds. Um, some of the other recipes that are up there um, are going to use your whole seeds, your coriander, and your herbs. Uh, I've got some recipes for some mustard. I use a little bit of dill in my spicy German mustard, which is awesome. And um, in my garden risotto, I'm using the, the shell peas that I've saved and frozen when I'm making it out of season. And the cannellini beans, vegetarian baked beans, um, 
pot beans, red beans and rice. If you go white instead of red, I mean, it's got all sorts of options up there. So, uh, but twice as tasty.com, I've got a bunch of those recipes for you. And like I said, sign up on the mailing list and I'll send uh, information with a lot of those recipe links so that uh, you can find some of these ones that I'm focused on. Any questions about the seed side? All right. I'll just sit up here and jabber about food all day. So, <laughs> um, next part I wanted to talk about are tops and shoots. So, can anybody think of something you grow in your garden where you're eating both the root and the top? Beets. Onions. Carrots. Beets. Mm-hmm. Carrots. Yep. Beets are the first one that usually come to, to my mind. I mean, they even sell them in the grocery store that way. Onions, if you grow your own, absolutely. I'm cutting the tops off of the onions in, as, they're, uh, as they're growing in the spring and, and setting new tops, and I'm using those uh, like I would a scallion. I don't actually grow scallions. I just grow head onions, and I use those tops. I do grow walking onions for my early season um, and use those as well, Egyptian walking onions. So, um, so yeah tops and roots, those two. Carrots are an awesome one that I just started playing with in the last couple years, and I've got a recipe up on my blog for carrot top salsa. Um, you can take those greens if you're growing your carrots, and essentially it's, it's all part of the same family as parsley and things, so you can use it in the same way. And it makes an awesome tasting salsa. Um, you can also use it to make a pesto, um, and I've got a recipe that uh, I found this year that I'm gonna try this summer for a granita. So, which is uh, kind of the ice, frozen ice dessert. They're doing a granita, they're putting like a creme fraiche with it and some berries. I think it sounds awesome and it's gonna make a gorgeous photo with that green icy stuff under your, your yogurt and your, your bright berries. So carrot tops are an awesome one um, for eating the tops of things. Another one that, uh, that is really good is garlic. If you grow garlic, then you've got your scapes coming out. So anybody in here not know what a garlic scape is? It's okay to say. So garlic scape, as the plant grows up and you put out your green leaves and then it starts to put out that hard shoot in the center and it sets a little bulblet up at the top of it. So you can use that bulblet, you can, you can let it go to seed, it's, it's what it's essentially doing up there on top. It's setting flower and then it'll set seed and grow garlic from it. But it takes a lot longer time. You're gonna get a better effect if you save your whole head clove of your garlic and you re divide that up and replant that. So instead of bothering to save the seed from the top of the garlic, what I do is as those shoots first start coming up and they're real soft and tender, I start cutting them. And then you can use them like you would garlic in any recipe. And, um, and they're gonna be, have some of that garlic flavor. They're not gonna be quite as pungent, but they're gonna be ready far earlier than the rest of your garlic. One of the things that I love to make with them in the spring is a pea shoot garlic scape pesto. That recipe's up on my blog. And again, your pea shoots that are coming up as your pea plants start, those are just as edible and just as tasty as the peas that'll eventually show up. I love having you in my classes. <laughs> I just get the best reactions out of her. <laughs> so, um, so those are just as edible. And if you are like me, when you go and you plant peas, you always plant them a little too close together and then you gotta go out and try to thin them. And pea plants don't like being thinned. If you've got sandy soil and you try to pull them out from the root, you're gonna disturb everybody around them. But if you cut them off and then you take those little baby shoots, cut them off early right as they're growing, Mix those with your garlic scapes. You've got an awesome spring pesto long before your basil is ready to go. Um, so that's another great use of, of things that you can use. Um, another one that I like to do that's kind of along the same line is chive blossom vinegar. Again, recipe I've got up on my blog. It's, um, it's awesome when you do it with the regular standard chive heads that are purple. Um, what you'll end up doing, because as those stalks come up, as you notice if you grow chives, your leaves, they're soft, they're awesome, you can just sprinkle them on everything. What, the, what sets up the flower and that stalk, that's harder and, and really kind of woody and usually not as desirable to eat. And you can let it go to seed, but chives regrow without needing to go to seed. So there's no need to really let that flower totally seed to keep your chive population going in your own garden or even in a friend's garden, they divide easily. Um, but you can save, that fl save those flowers, clip them as they come off, and they're gonna have that same chive taste. I love the flowers, I just toss them in salads and things like that and pasta dishes as I'm cooking and eat them that way. Some people don't like the texture, 
So um, if, you, if you try it and you're like, Julie told me to eat the flower head of chives and it feels really funny in my mouth, like I'm eating a, um, a big puff ball, you know, um, then if that's kind of your reaction, you can always pull them apart and just sprinkle, you know, take the whole head, pull it apart and sprinkle the individual heads. The other thing you can do is you can take those and you can put them in a jar of vinegar and water and essentially pickle them. And at the same time, if you do the purple ones, you're going to get this gorgeous pink vinegar that comes out of it because they're going to distribute all of that color in there. It only takes a few days. You can eat the pickled ones as well. They're going to have both that chive onion flavor and the, and the pickling flavor to them. Um, I also do them. I grow garlic chives, and they put out big white flower heads, and that's a fun one to do. It doesn't color my vinegar, but the flavor is really awesome. I pick up a little hint of onion, a little hint of, of, uh, of stuff in there. So. Um, I usually use, for this recipe, I usually use white wine vinegar. Um, you're doing it as a fridge pickle, so you can use even um, just brief pickling thing here. Uh, most of the time, if you want to process pickles, you're looking for a vinegar that's 5% acidity. Um, if you're doing a fridge pickle and you're going to be using it short term, you know, in this case, you're pickling the chives, uh, the blossoms, and you're taking them out pretty quickly, um, and you're just using the remaining vinegar after that. So you're not trying to preserve the blossoms themselves in there. So you could use a, an Asian vinegar as well, which usually comes in at 4.2, 4.3% for a rice vinegar. Um, I, for this recipe, I don't like to use apple cider. It's got too much of its own flavor. And distilled vinegar, I hardly ever use in pickling. I use it all the time to clean my kitchen, but I hardly ever use it put it into a jar. So yeah, so that's a great one there. Um, yes? On the garlic. Escapes. Okay, but there's other things that come up too. So last year I cut everything off, and so the garlic didn't grow. So if you just cut the scape. Just the scape, yep. So when it grows up, you're going to have leaves, that, the big broad leaves that come out, and then you're going to have the scape that comes up the middle. You just want to cut, cut the scapes. It needs those leaves to keep producing. But by cutting the scape, you're preventing it from setting, a, setting seed, and it's putting more energy into its root. So most plants, they put all their energy into their roots until they're like, oh, it's getting to be the end of the growing season, which you know around here is about two days after the season starts. Um, and then they start to think about setting seed and putting energy there. So, um, so yeah, you're just cutting that scape part. And what I've found with garlic scapes is that if I want to use them for anything where I'm going to actually eat the whole scape, like a pesto or fresh in a dish or something like that, I cut them early. I cut them at first. I was like, oh, I'm going to wait till they start to curl. And then they just start to get woody at the base of that garlic scape. You can still do a few things with them. I'll talk about that later on. Remind me if I don't. Um, but I like to cut them super early just as they're starting to put out, just as they're putting seed heads and use them. And they'll actually continue to try to grow that stock, um, but they won't ever be able to set another seed head off of it. And then they'll put all that energy into your bulb that way. Cut off the leaves. It doesn't have anything to work with. <laughs> yep, unfortunately. So next year, you'll get it right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so garlic's a good one. Radish greens are another awesome one that you can use. Radish green and scrap from your radishes in a chimichurri. Oh, so delicious. Got lots of spicy and heat things. Um, other ones that, uh, that we might not think of um, are things like, you know, perhaps you do, perhaps you don't, chard and celery. You know, we're growing them to use their stalks, but all their leaves and things are as edible as well. Personally, celery is one of the few vegetables I don't like. I don't like the texture of, so I always tend to use the leaves from it because I get less of that stringy celery texture. And uh, Swiss chard, I'm growing as much for the greens as I am for the stalk. I'm using it like a baby green and cutting it down super early in the season and putting all those in salads. And it's only when I start to lose track of it and it explodes on me when I turn my back for two days that uh, I end up getting stocks out of it. So those are all awesome options. Um, and uh, yeah, other ones like uh, I talked about, oh, like seeds in their pods, like I talked about with the snap pea, uh, the snap pea options there. So yeah, any questions about tops and shoots? Cool. Moving on. Um, Roots, scraps, and peels. So outside of root vegetables, like our onions, our beets, things like that, 
a lot of us don't think about eating the root of a vegetable. It's down there, it's putting in energy, it's growing in the dirt and all those kind of things. Um, but when, when it comes down to it, when you pull it out and you clean it up, you're usually got some sort of root left. You know, on the carrot, you'll have a root end that you don't really want to use. You'll have the shoulder you don't really want to just munch on usually. Same with onions. You'll have your bottoms and, and your tops and your skins and things like that. So using a lot of these skin scraps and peels is something that absolutely send them to the compost. They're awesome. But you can also do a few things to get some flavors out of them. And some of them are things that until I started being like, okay, I'm on this kick. Is there something I can do with this? And then I researched it. I never would have thought of. One of my favorite new ones is strawberry hulls because no matter, it doesn't matter what you're doing to use with strawberries, you're sitting there spending all this time taking off the hulls and the stems. And so what I've, what I've discovered, um, I found some people who are doing some fun things with the tops. You start by dehydrating them so you don't have to worry about any, any fungus and things like that. And then you use them for infusions. You can use them in tea. Uh, you can use them in, I've been using them in bitters. Last year I made uh, hop leaf and strawberry bitters, which was awesome to go in cocktails. Um, got a few cocktail fun things in case you haven't noticed. Um, the other cocktail fun thing is we, uh, we used them. Uh, my gardening partner is a huge fan of, of tequila strawberry beverages. So we just threw some in some tequila, infused it. I've got this rosy pink tequila. And it's just kind of a subtle flavor when you infuse it in the alcohol with just the hulls instead of the fruit. But now I don't feel like I'm wasting my fruit on the infusion. I could actually use this, and then I get to use the byproduct for, for the other recipes. So the strawberry hulls are kind of fun. Um, I've also been playing with cherry pits. Cherry pits is kind of an interesting one. You, you definitely want to do a little bit of research before you decide if you're comfortable going down that road. Because in the core of all your stone fruits, that seed, cyanide. So you don't want to risk something that you're potentially uncomfortable with. The research I've done tells me that as long as I keep that pit whole and intact, I'm getting very little risk of it. It's originally what they were using to make almond extract because the pits have almond flavor um, before they went to chemical means. So, um, so yeah, by all means, get, make sure you're comfortable if you're going to start playing down that road. Do a little bit of reading and do some research. Um, but what I've found is that it makes uh, an awesome infusion for a bourbon to put those cherry pits in there after I've cleaned them off. Uh, this coming up this year, expect to see on my blog some things with smoked cherries. We started smoking sour cherries last year. Amazing, amazing in cocktails, amazing in syrups and salsas. Um, so, so yeah, definitely keep in mind when you do stone fruits, but uh, it's an option. Made bitters. Out of the leaves, another top to root byproduct. I dried them first, yep, and then I did the infusion. So the dehydration of stuff like that is you're letting it sit in the alcohol for a while, which is, should be killing everything. But if you've got something on there you're worried about with fungus and moisture and stuff, then you're good to go. But yeah, so I didn't have to actually take away my friend's hops themselves. He could still use those in his beer. But I just grabbed a few leaves, and it doesn't take very many. So, yeah. So those are some good ones with the fruit. Other good fruit ones, citrus peels. A lot of you may already do that. You're zesting your fruit and, uh, and you're using it for things. I often find that I'm using more zest than juice when I go in and buy uh, my citrus fruit. Um, you can save it if, uh, if you're in the other camp and you've got too much zest. Um, it can be candied. Um, it can be dried. And you can use it in a, in a seasoning kind of mix. Um, my personal favorite is just to stick it in the freezer. It's easy, and then I just take it out when I want to use it next, particularly if I'm using it in things like where if I'm baking it into breads or something like that. Um, I don't care what the final texture and color looks like because it will soften in the freezer, but that's just super easy process. Um, for, your, for your vegetables, we've got all sorts of options for some of those root scraps. Uh, I'm a pickler, and I'm also a fermenter, as part of my pickling. So a lot of my beet scraps, those will end up into a ferment. You can, um, you can use them to make kvass, which if you don't know is typically a, a Russian uh, fermented beverage made out of rye bread. Uh, beet kvass is a, is a popular option if you're into those kind of drinks. Um, lightly alcoholic, and I lived in Russia for a while. They seriously treat it like soda over there, but then they also drink, you know, a bottle of 
vodka per person, so lightly alcoholic. Um, the, uh, the other options for, uh, for your beets and turnips and things are, um, are you can use them in your, in your fermented veg recipes a lot of times. And um, one I particularly have enjoyed playing with lately is as I'm fermenting onions, I've been using, if I'm doing red onions, I've been using a beet, uh, half of a beet on top, and it acts partially as a weight, and then it also helps to send that color as the ferment happens, it sinks that color in and gets even more color into my red onion uh, ferments, which is kind of fun. Um, brassicas, we all, you know, if you shave your brassica and you're using it for a salad or things like that, you're always throwing out the core of your cabbage if you're doing things. You can actually go ahead and shred that core um, to use in a, a kraut and things like that. It's going to soften up in your ferments. If you peel the outer layers off of your broccoli and you shred it with like a microplaner like you would with Parmesan cheese, um, you're going to end up with with shreds that, are, that aren't going to feel like they're too stiff and woody and edible. You eat them raw, um, sprinkle it on something where, especially if you're trying to cut back on cheese, I don't know why you would, but if you are, um, <laughs> sprinkle it on, on something you'd normally be inclined to sprinkle cheese on and it gives you that look and that feel and that texture and it's kind of fun one. Um, one of the other ones, like I was talking about with the beet for color, one of the other ones I do with, for color is red onion skins. When, um, when I'm processing, uh, uh, sweet pepper jelly and chili jelly and things like that. If you have this, anybody in here made the pepper jellies before? Um, so you'll notice you got these gorgeous bright red peppers and as you go through the processing the color fades and the color fades um, particularly um, with some of your homegrown peppers that are heirlooms. They just might not have as much color in them to start with. If you save your red onion skins, just the dried skins, make sure they're clean and don't have dirt on them and stuff throw that in when you're making your jelly liquid, pull them back out um, when you go to strain it, it's going to infuse some of that color in there. And I found that if there is any noticeable flavor, I don't notice any, but if there is, onions and peppers, what's wrong with that? So works out to be a good one. Um, another one that often you don't think of is herb stems. You go and you buy herbs and you just whack off the stems and then you start chopping your leaves for your recipe. Those stems can be just as usable. Uh, you'll need to have a food, if you want that same texture that you're going to get, they're going to take a little more effort to chop them up and grind them finely. So you're going to want a food processor that's pretty powerful to, to grind them all down, but you can grind them down for pestos and things like that. The only ones that I still don't really do, and then we're talking soft stems, I'm not talking rosemary or anything like that, those, those woody guys you leave alone. Um, the soft stems, the only ones that I really don't play with still are parsley. Um, they tend to be a lot more bitter than the leaf. Cilantro is the other way, it tastes the same all the way through, but parsley, the stem can be more bitter than the leaf. So before you go to the work of processing your parsley stems, take a bite, see what you think. If you're like, oh, these are, these are a little bitter for me, then just send them for your compost and just use your tops. So um, yeah, any other, any questions about that part? I was curious, like if you had a, a huge jalapeno plant or something along those lines, mm -hmm. What would you do with something along those, like with that? I didn't hear you mention pepper leaves or anything like that in particular. I have not played with pepper leaves yet. That is on my to-do list. Yeah, so far I've just been playing with the, with the uh, peppers themselves. And the seeds themselves, you can, you can save the seeds for culinary because it'll be like your, your red pepper flakes. Um, that you might buy commercially at the store, the seeds have all that heat in them, um, as well as saving them to, to replant in your garden. But yeah, I haven't gone the route of the leaves yet. That's my, that's, that's the next adventure. <laughs> so, yeah. Any others? Yeah. Oh, what about leek tops? Leek tops are those, those green hard ones. Yeah. They are awesome, except that you just don't want to chew them, <laughs> you know? So leek tops are one of those ones that I will save and I use in all my stocks, um, my, my veg stocks, any, essentially as an infusion is what I primarily do for wheat, leek tops. Uh, you can do both leek tops and garlic scapes, not just in a liquid infusion like a broth, but in an oil. So if you're going to be sauteing something, throw your leek tops in or your garlic scapes in before you start. Um, just let them heat up and, and absorb some of those flavors for a few minutes pull them back out and then throw in what you're going to cook and it's going to pick up some of that flavor in your recipe is another one I like to do. 
But yeah, I've yet to find, and I, I got a new food processor this year. The thing works like crazy and just blends up everything. But leek tops, eh, still, still not the texture I want to eat. <laughs> so, any others? Cool. So moving on, um, let's see. Oh, and in that category, talk a couple of recipes. As I mentioned, color for your sweet pepper jelly. What do you guess? I got a recipe on my blog. Um, I've also got recipes up there for pestos and for herb butter, which is another one that I like to use the stems in. Even if your pro food processor isn't um, all that powerful and you're like, ah, oh, they're a little coarse, if you make it into an herb butter and then you freeze that herb butter, by the time you go to slice it and use it, they'll have softened up and you'll get that same flavor so you can save your leaves for your fresh use or butter with the stems for your freezer and kind of double down that way. So um, moving on, solids and liquids. So this is solids versus liquids. This is the one that I was talking about at the beginning where I got the salsa and I've got my tomato juice. Um, there's so many recipes, particularly if you're processing food, where they're essentially just calling for the solids or they're just calling for the juice. And so if they're just calling for the solids, either you're draining or you're cooking down or you're, you know, you're doing something and pressing. And a lot of times recipes will just, if they tell you anything, they'll say to discard it. Um, usually they don't even tell you that. They just, they just move on. You drain it and then you move on to the part you're using and, and they just assume that that disappears magically somewhere. Um, as a recipe writer, part of that's just because we don't have the time and space to give you all of the options and everything. But um, it's also just because a lot of people don't think that way. They, they just focus on what they're trying to make and achieve and go from there like I did when I first started with my salsa. There's a lot of different options for going both directions. Um, and it's the same way if you're coming from the juicing side. If you're doing juice, your goal is to get your juice and all that. You end up with all this pulp. I don't do a lot of um, juicing where I'm processing juices that are thicker. I do a lot more of draining of liquids to get... Um, to get shrubs and things like that. So the pulp that I end up with is still essentially as full of flavor as when I started. I know when you're juicing, depending on what you're processing, sometimes you just lose a lot of flavor in that pulp and it may or may not be worth deciding to, uh, to save and use. So something to definitely think about. But this whole concept of, okay, I'm gonna use both the solids and the juice is something I play a lot with on my blog. Um, one of my favorite ones is to do, for sweet things, is to do jams and syrups. And so I will, instead of using pectin in my recipe or, um, or making something that's a really soft, um, liquidy jam, I end up saying, okay, I'm going to separate out my solids and my liquids, and then I'm going to get a jam product, and I'm going to get a syrup, fruit syrup out of this process. So uh, one of the ones that I really love to do is rhubarb. I make rhubarb orange marmalade. And um, these recipes are paired on my blog. Again, sign up on the list and I'll get email links to you guys. I started to do a handout and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to put so many links in it. So, um, so I'll send you to the blog instead. But, um, but yeah, rhubarb orange ginger marmalade, a recipe that my grandmother used to make, I grew up making. And instead of trying to cook down all that liquid and all that, I ended up saying, okay, I'm gonna cook it and then I'm gonna drain off the juice. Juice, I turn into rhubarb rosemary syrup. It is fabulous in with just seltzer water. It's fabulous in cocktails. It's fabulous poured over ice cream or your sourdough waffles or your homemade pancakes. Um, it's, and then I end up with, with two things out of the same process. When I do this, particularly with the rhubarb, expect to see a color change in that jar. Rhubarb, when you cook it down, it turns that lovely pink color and then you drain that juice off and now you've got kind of this dullish colored thing in your jar. So expect that color. If you're like, oh, I'm gonna do this as gifts, they're gonna want that bright pink rhubarb, then go ahead and just keep it in there and run the batch as usual. Um, for my personal eating, I'm not caring what the color looks like. It still tastes just as flavorful. And if you grow a rhubarb around here, you may not get all that much color out of your rhubarb anyway. So um, just depending on the variety you grow, some of my rhubarb tends to be super bright red and then on the outside, and then when I cut it open in the middle, it's pure green all through. So 
that's a good option for there. Um, and I do that process with a lot of other syrups, strawberries. I'll do a strawberry chamomile syrup and a strawberry Thai herb jam. Um, raspberries, I'll do roasted raspberry syrup. Raspberries are an interesting one because once I drain that juice off, that's really seedy pulp. And just as an experiment one year, I'm like, I'm just going to can it up as raspberry jam and see what happens. And I got a, several lovely jars of golden raspberry seed. <laughs> so don't recommend canning the raspberry straight up if you're going to take all that juice out of it. But it does work well with other things. Apricot raspberry jam is one of my favorites if I'm using just the raspberry pulp. Um, and I'm going to can up the two processes. Um, another one that, um, again, I mentioned about the smoked cherries that I played with this last year was um, smoked sour cherry tequila salsa. This started as a ball canning recipe. They had me review um, their new ball canning cookbook a couple years ago, and I made this recipe out of it. Fabulous salsa. I loved it out the door. A little watery for my, for my preference because I tend to like thicker salsas. And, um, and at the time, I was just their recipe just calls for cherries. Um, so I use sour ones. Uh, I think they may have even been using sweet ones in the original recipe. But now that I'm smoking cherries, I'm like, OK, now I'm going to make this salsa really smoky. I'm not just going to rely on chipotles to get smoke in there. I'm going to smoke the cherries themselves and put them in there. And by doing that, I've pre-cooked the cherries. I take them off. I drain them. Now I've got juice. I've got smoked sour cherry basil syrup, also the bomb, incredible tasting. Had some on waffles the other day. Um, these are not yet on the blog, but I'm expecting they will be part of my rotation this coming year because I'm having fun. Can you describe how you do the smoking process? Yes, our smoking is very low key and old school. We are on a um, old Weber black standard Weber cooker grill, and um, it's a hand me down. I think we're maybe the third owners of this thing, and we just keep cobbling it back together every time a leg falls off. So we are just smoking with briquettes and with wood chips. Um, depending on what we're smoking, we might change the variety. If you go to my blog, I've got um, instructions up there. The best one is probably for smoked chilies. Um, we're smoking chili peppers this way. And they talk about the balance of briquettes to heat, how to keep that temperature low. I don't actually play with a full-scale smoker uh, because I don't eat. Uh, I eat, I'm pescatarian. I eat fish, but I don't eat other meats. And I don't have a large smoker because around here I don't really have a need for it. I don't get enough of my own fish that I want to be smoking. So um, everything we're doing, I'm smoking vegetables and fruits and cheese. And that's all a really low temperature. So I found it actually works really well and sometimes even better than trying to smoke it on your Traeger because you just can't get that temperature low enough sometimes without an extra component contraption, things like that. So uh, it all depends on what you're smoking. The cherries, they're just picking up some flavor. I'm, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I want to say I'm maybe using eight briquettes, and it's taken me an hour is what I spend on there. So um, beets are one that are a quick smoke with, if you, if you pre-roast them. I tried smoking beets on the grill with the smoker, and they really do need to be cooked first. So either you grill them first or you pre-roast them in the oven first and then you smoke them. You're just trying to add flavor. You know, they're taking 20, 30 minutes to get that smoked flavor to beets, which makes an awesome upgrade. Um, Are you pitting the cherries first then? Uh, I've done it. I did it both ways this last year because I wanted to experiment for cocktail cherries. So um, I did some that I pitted. The ones that I did for the salsa, I pitted ahead of time. And then the cocktail cherries, I left the pits in and the stems on, wondering if I was going to want those for photos and things and garnish and stuff to be that way. And um, dropped them, the pitted ones and the unpitted ones in some bourbon, left them in the fridge for a couple months. Same flavor um, that I got out of both of them. I found that for our personal use, we'd rather have the pits out. And when I smoke them, the cherries lose some color, and they lose both the stems and the fruits. So for a pretty cocktail, they just weren't going to look as pretty anyway. So going forward, I am going to pull those pits out first. So yeah. Are you using an apple wood for the smoking, or what do you use? It depends on what we're smoking. Yeah, sometimes we're using apple. Sometimes we're using cherry. It just kind of depends on what we're putting on there. 
For the cherries specifically, though? For the cherries specifically, I think I just threw whatever I had sitting closest at hand, yeah. Yeah, I usually try to be more specific with um, a wood I'm choosing when I'm smoking cheese because I find that the cheese will absorb that particular wood flavor. Something like a cherry or a beet, it's got so much flavor going on in it, I don't notice quite as much distinction in the flavors from the wood. Um, so, yeah, yeah, changing those up. Do you smoke peppers whole, or do you cut them? Uh, chilies, I, chilies, I have been cutting first. Um, let me think about this. Yes, I actually, I'm cutting everything now first. Uh, when I started smoking chilies, I had some, uh, some little Thai chilies and other really small hot peppers in there. They started going off like fireworks inside the, <laughs> the, uh, inside the grill as they were smoking. So um, decided that they needed a little airspace to open up. And then I found after the fact that it was easier to get the seeds out before they smoked then and cut them off than afterwards. And um, so I did go that route. And then this last year, I discovered one of my favorite things to do with smoked chilies is to make home smoked chili paste. A little digression here. Um, I set out to make sriracha, which is a fermented garlic chili paste, as you probably know. And of course, my immediate mind, before I even made my first batch of sriracha, was like, wouldn't it be cool if it was smoky sriracha? That'd be so much fun. So I did it with smoked chilies without really realizing that even at the cold smoke temperature I'm doing, that temperature is up high enough that I've killed the bacteria that are gonna cause it to ferment. So the fermentation didn't work, but I had the most amazing smoked chili paste, which is now all I make. I've, I've given up on sriracha for the moment and um, moved on to home smoked chili paste. So I found for my batch this last year that I had been in a rush and neglected to pull all of the seeds out when I went to do that and didn't really, re and what I ended up doing, I got rushed at the end of the season, smoked up the chilies, threw them in a bag, threw them in the freezer. And I had a, some chili paste left from the prior year when I ran out. Then I pulled them out of the freezer and made my chili paste. And I just threw it all in the food processor. And then I went, oh, there's a lot of seed in here. I think I must not have deceded all these guys. Still tastes awesome. I just got a little more heat this year than I usually do. <laughs> so. But yeah, play with it for sure. I found it's easier for me to pull them out ahead of time. Um, and with the big peppers, I usually pull them out ahead of time for smoking as well. They just get so soft and mushy and, and things like that otherwise. So, yeah. Um, what else have I got on my list here? One last thing. Oh, yeah. No, do it. So when you're smoking, do mm -hmm. you shoot for a specific temperature? We do, yeah. I've got, um, I've just got a thermometer like you'd hang inside your oven to check the temperature in there, and um, it depends on what I'm smoking off the top of my head. I know that the temperature where I was killing my bacteria for my chilies was 135, um, so I'm trying to smoke below that. I believe for cheese, we're trying to keep it just over 100 because otherwise it starts to get melty. Um, so. I'd have to double check that number. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, we're, we're smoking in that real low temperature range. So if you've got a Traeger and you're used to smoking meats and stuff like that, um, definitely look at, at what your range is there when you start to throw your, your fruit and veg on. Because you get at the higher temperatures, it'll still be an awesome product. It's just going to be grilled instead of smoked for the most part. So, yeah. And you'll burn through more wood chips. <laughs> um, other options in the Fruit category, solids to liquids. I want to talk, talk briefly about these bottles here. Um, I make shrub. Anybody know what a drinking shrub is in here, or is this a new thing to all you guys? All right. You've heard of kombucha. Kombucha is fermented beverage. Drinking shrub is basically, you've got your fermented pickled cucumbers, your vinegar pickled cucumbers. Shrub is basically your vinegar pickled version of kombucha. So instead of a fermentation, you're taking some fruit, you're taking some sugar, you're taking some vinegar. You're mixing it all together, you're taking out the juice, and you've got your shrub. It's a super simple, easy process. It is what, it's the precursor to soda. Before Coca-Cola was around, when the farmer owners didn't want their farm hands to drink beer all day in the fill, field, gave them shrub. The vinegar in it is going to be refreshing and all that kind of stuff. And the flavor options are endless. Um, I've even made a shrub with beet stems, talking about using top to root here put the stems in, made the shrub. Some people like it, some people don't. It's got that dirty, 
beet kind of flavor going on to it. If you're the type of person who doesn't like really smoky peaty scotch, this may not be the shrub for you. But um, I like smoky peaty scotch, so I like the shrub. I, but I particularly like it, and even people who didn't like it straight with just uh, soda water were loving it with lemonade. Just a little shot of it in some lemonade, and it just makes a whole different flavor. Um, for, for shrubs, I'll go all over the map. I'll use apple cider vinegar, red wine vinegar, white wine vinegar. Um, uh, I'll do the, uh, the Asian. It really depends on the fruit I'm using and just kind of pairing it with it. I'll even use balsamic vinegar, although I've tried doing some um, with balsamic. And if you do, I recommend scaling it way back to start with. I found that the first recipes I tried, which were, I think, a blend of balsamic and white wine vinegar, little too um, syrupy, heavy, dense balsamic. They overpowered the strawberry flavor. But when I dialed it back and I used more of the white wine vinegar, a little bit of balsamic, my strawberries, and then some peppercorns, awesome shrub. It is, it is essentially the liquid. It's basically like your pickled fruit brine. So this bottle here is um, the liquid leftover, I made Asian pickled pears with some ginger, some citrus, and things like that. And then I had this brine left over. It's essentially a shrub because it's got some sugar in the, the pickling brine to begin with because it was a sweeter pickle for the pears. So I can go ahead and drink this like I would a shrub, which is this is a concentrate. I'm not just going to chug out of this bottle. I'm going to pour a little bit into my water bottle, pour some liquid into it. I, I prefer um, seltzer water, fizzy water and uh, kind of gives it that effervescent flavor. Stir it together, you just keep adjusting the balance as you like, play with it in other cocktails, beverages, mixes, things like that. So this, I created a pickle brine, and now that I've eaten all the fruit out of it, I've got a shrub left. This one I intentionally set out to make a shrub. Um, so this was a uh, plum peppercorn shrub, and it's got some bay leaf in it. And so what I ended up doing was this particular batch was um, at the end of last growing season, I have Italian plume, prune plums, the, the real long, oblong, dense guys. Cut them in half, took out the pits, threw a big bag of them in the freezer to deal with later. And when I pulled them out of the freezer, I pulled them out at Christmas time to make my niece's favorite fruit rolls. We call them plum yum. They are a blend of plum and applesauce, homemade applesauce. And she eats them like crazy. So I was making some of those for Christmas. And because I'd had them in the freezer, when I went out and defrosted the plums, the juice naturally just separated. So I just took the juice, mixed the juice, strained them out, mixed the juice with some vinegar and some sugar, and put my herbs in, shook it up, let it sit a couple days. I've got my shrub. This is the last of what was two bottles from uh, the end of November, and it's still, you know, it's still around because I just haven't finished it, but it keeps a long time that way. You can set out to make shrub, in, and then I took the, uh, sorry, to continue with that, that process of the top to root, I took those, um, those prunes and plums, threw them in the food processor with my applesauce, made my fruit leather. By taking out that liquid at that stage, normally I would just blend them all together and dehydrate them, but by taking it out at that stage, it cut my dehydration time way down. And uh, so another advantage is you're just reducing that energy there and coming up with, uh, with something for me to enjoy and something for her to enjoy both. So the other process for a shrub that you can do is either with, um, is with a raw fruit shrub, is you take the fruit itself, mix it with your sugar, and let it macerate, uh, which basically means it sits overnight and uh, the sugar pulls those juices out and starts to separate them, and then you drain it. And unlike a jelly where you're going to be cooking it and you're trying to prevent it from being cloudy and stuff like that, you can press on it and get as much juice as you can out of there. And then you can make your, your shrub based on that. Your ratios, you'll see when you go to my blog and look at recipes for raw shrub, you'll see the ratios are different for your sugar to vinegar than if I'm just putting sugar straight in here because some of that sugar stays with my fruit, solids, and some of that ends up in my shrub. Then you mix in your vinegar and away you go. Um, other people, a lot of other people do shrub recipes where they'll put everything all in the jar at once, which is definitely an option, but I've decided I prefer to do the sugar and fruit separately and then separate out my juice and add my vinegar because then 
all of a sudden my fruit is so much more usable and doesn't taste too vinegary and I can put that fruit to use. So after I've made a shrub from scratch, say uh, a strawberry, the strawberry balsamic, I've macerated my strawberries, let them sit overnight in the sugar, strained out the juice. Now I've got these solids left. I take those, I just shove them into an ice cube tray and freeze them up. And then when it's winter time and I'm making smoothies all winter as I'm getting ready to leave the house in the morning, throw a couple cubes of those into my smoothie mix. And so instead of using the strawberries that I've frozen whole to use specifically for something, I'm using up my byproduct in my smoothies and the other liquid in the shrubs. So same process if you want to do a fruit syrup and you don't want to can a jam, you're like, eh, I'm not into the whole canning thing. I just want to do this quick and easy. You can do the same thing. Mass rate, separate, separate your juice and solids. You can make a syrup and you can just keep it in the fridge because you're going to end up, unless you're doing a giant, giant batch, like multiple batches of berries, you're going to end up with maybe two jars of syrup for every batch of jam you try to process. So you can just do it as a fridge jam, leave it in the fridge, cook it up real briefly, and you can cook that to whatever texture you like. Um, if you're going to be putting it on, syrup, on uh, waffles and pancakes and things like that, make it a little thicker if you like it that way. If you're going to be using it in cocktails, just cook it enough to dissolve those sugars, throw it in the fridge, and away you go. And then your solids, freeze them in your ice cubes, and you can use those in your smoothies. I'm a huge fan of the, the smoothie ice cube thing. I do beet greens that way. I do you know, all of my veggie ingredients for my smoothies as well. So, um, so those are some of the, the fruit variations. Uh, as I talked about some of the, uh, the beverage, other vegetable beverage variations, I was doing the, the salsa and the Bloody Mary mix. I do the same grilled tomato process to make pasta sauce. And um, I've decided that um, I don't necessarily need to drink that many Bloody Marys over the course of a year. Um, so besides just drinking the Bloody Mary mix straight up, which is what I do a lot of right now, is I've just been freezing the juice um, with a little bit of the solids. I've got a ratio on my blog that I found works really well. And then I use that as the basis for a tomato soup. So instead of starting with whole tomatoes, I get my salsa, that's all canned, that's all ready, or my pasta sauce ready to go, and then I can save my juice, and I can use that and pull it out of the freezer and make soups all winter out of that. Do you make ketchup? I do not, because I don't use a lot of ketchup, not being a, a, a big meat person. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, you certainly can. You can certainly make up ketchup, and it is... I am not positive because I'm just starting on the recipe list, but it is likely one I'm going to be developing to, uh, to go in this new cookbook. Um, there's an, one out there that I really want to try. Does anybody in here besides me go grow gooseberries? Gooseberries? I found a recipe the other day for a gooseberry ketchup, and I'm like, that sounds like a ketchup I could get behind. So might be too obscure to, to end up in this next project, but uh, I may be playing with that one. So. What I do make a lot of are savory jams and chutneys, and I kind of use those instead of ketchups on some things that other people might put ketchup on. So, um, so yeah, besides the salsa and the tomato, the grilling, another one that I grill, tomatillos. Uh, this, this was a huge discovery for me because I'm like, okay, I'm doing this with tomatoes. Love the grilled tomatillo salsa. This is awesome. What can I do with tomatillo juice? Because it's you don't really want to just turn it into your, um, your soup for the day with just the juice necessarily. But what I did discover is if you're a fan of margaritas, it makes a fabulous substitute for sweet and sour. So if you're somebody who likes a sweet and sour margarita, and that I just freeze in cubes. And after I grill it, I don't bother processing it otherwise. And then when I know I'm going to make a batch of margaritas, pull it out, defrost it, make up my margarita blend. Um, I make homemade triple sec to go in there, cutting down on the corn syrup, so it turns into some pretty awesome cocktails. And again, if you're not an alcohol person, super great as a virgin beverage. So that's another fun one that's up there. Um, and like I said, these are all pairings that, uh, that I've played with on the blog. Other ones that you can play with um, that I've got some recipes for on my blog, but they don't have this kind of adaptation, uh, black bean veggie burgers. Uh, you can take some of your veggie pulp, pumpkin pulp, other juicing pulp and things like that. Roll some of that into those processes. Carrots uh, are a good one for quick breads and muffins and things like that. Gross, roll some of that in there instead of using 
uh, fresh carrot grating. Uh, the brines from pickling, if you're like, you know, Julie told me about these shrub things and I just don't get it, it's not my thing, I won't be offended. Uh, they do make awesome salad dressings. I also like to use my leftover pick and bri pickle brine to braise things. I do braise breakfast potatoes, pour a little bit of the brine in there as after I finish frying the potatoes, give them a little braise, it gets some awesome flavor on there. Um, and besides the fruits and vegetables, we've got um, our options for non-fruit and vegetable things. Like I said, I don't eat meats, but um, I eat a lot of cheese. I make my own cheese, I make my own yogurt. So I, coming up with uses for whey has been a huge one of my projects because that's a, if you make cheese, you generate an awful lot of whey. So I've got some recipes up on the blog that are using yogurt whey in some berry muffins, um, mashed potatoes, uh, cheese whey. I'll, I'll cook that whey down to use it makes a sauce. It makes the most awesome uh, mac and cheese you've ever tasted by cooking down that whey. So you're essentially getting all of that whey and using another product. Yogurt whey in particular, you can substitute for just about anything that calls for buttermilk. So if you're making your own yogurt and you're straining it to get a thicker yogurt and you've got that whey left over, think about those recipe options. And then the other end is stocks as well, um, all your trimmings and your peelings. So what will happen this month on my food blog, I'll put up some notes this coming week that will uh, be from this workshop and some of the things that I've been sharing and talking about today. Put up some of these recipe links so they're easy for you to find. And then over the course of this month, I'm going to add, be adding some more recipes that will be um, stocks from scraps, talking about making a quick stock so you're like, I don't want to keep a stock around. Make it from the scraps that you're going to use for your soup ahead of time and then you're all ready to go and you've got just enough stock for your soup. You don't have to do the storage. I'm going to be playing with some of those recipes on the blog all this month. Um, and I did mention up at the beginning about going too far. There's a fabulous cookbook out by a Danish chef, Maz Resland, um, called Scraps, Wilts, and Weeds. Uh, check it out. You can check it out at the library as soon as I return it. Um, <laughs> and he's got a fabulous quote in there. Sometimes it is too much to use the whole. So with all of these processes, if you're like, okay, Julie, these sound amazing, but I'm not going to grill tomatoes and then make salsa and then process it and do that. That's just outside of my wheelhouse. Sometimes it does go too far. And even for me, um, I brought one example here of one that I did, ground kale. I was like, I've you know, whenever I go and I grow kale and I use it, all I'm using are the leaves and even maybe even not all of those. So what am I going to do with all these stems? This source or one of my other ones, I can't remember who now, was recommending dehydrating them and grinding them up into a powder. And so I did that. And so I, you know, I'm like, okay, that's a super easy process. I cut off the stem. I got it anyway. Throw it in the dehydrator. Then I grind it up. It's really not that involved of a process, but it's multi-step. I've cleaned it. I've spent the energy to dehydrate it. I've spent the time grinding it. Now I've got this jar of ground powder, and what am I going to do with it? <laughs> and the main use that a lot of people have for it is if you're trying to cut back your flour usage, you can start subbing some in to your pastas, your um, savory crepes, things like that. Personally, I find I don't have a flour, a gluten issue, a flour issue. Um, and I do a lot of things with sourdough, so I'm already negating all of my flour, any potential flour issues anyway for the most part. So I find this just sits on my shelf. It's from uh, September 2018. So um, it's still good, it's still valid, it's just not something I use. For me, that's taking it too far. Um, as another example, another cookbook I love, Batch, by uh, Canadians Joel McCharles and Dana Harrison. They've got a recipe there in there that sounds amazing for the intensity of the flavor, frozen fruit paste. But the process is you dehydrate the fruit, you rehydrate it, you cook it down, you puree it, you dehydrate it again, and then they store it in the freezer. And I mean, you're talking to somebody who's like, okay, I will happily take a beet and roast it and smoke it and then pickle it. But even this is a little too much of the process for me. So by all means, with what I've talked about here today, Start with what you feel comfortable and don't feel afraid to say, you know, that's just for me taking it a little too far. The rest goes in your compost. It all gets back into the recovery cycle. It's all awesome. I have talked almost an entire hour. Thank you all so much for listening. If you have any questions, please, I would love to hear them. I hope you did sign up um, to get on to the, uh, the mailing list because then I'll let you know about what's going up on the blog. 
If you don't want to give me your email, that's all right too. Just go to the blog and check it out. I'll be putting the stuff up all this month. And um, if you do sign up, I'll keep you posted about the progress on the new cookbook. I also have business cards back there if you're interested. And please, if you've got a couple of extra spare bucks, this entire event is put on by volunteers, including myself and all of the presenters you've been seeing here today. And we rely on donations and sponsors to keep it free for you. Thank you all very much.